<clears throat> Hello everyone. Good day. Um going to wait a minute here so that we can um get started. Going to bring you some information about Mexico's plans for the caravan and bring you um, information coming directly from the Mexican government, the Mexican administration. <clears throat> I am planning on um, bringing you an update also on the uh, restraining order situation that happened recently this at the beginning of this week uh, for uh, Paloma Zuniga, aka Paloma for Trump, and I have a lot of uh, details of what occurred and the outcome of that case, including audio of Paloma and her husband, etc., um, from from that date. So stay tuned for that and wait waiting for some folks to come in here. I'm going to be translating things today that I think are very important and relevant for you to know about what's going on with the caravan. And these are tactics we need to be on the lookout for. What I'm about to show you is what part of that new tactic is. As you know, we have um, enacted the migrant protection protocols, which requires most people requesting asylum in the United States to wait in Mexico unless that they unless they can prove that there is an immediate reason why they should be allowed to stay in the United States to what to wait for their hearing so something new is happening and that something new is that a lot of people are sending their children over unaccompanied that's what this headline says here sacrificing her mother's love, quote unquote. Migrant families are opting to send their children alone to cross the border. We're going to see the case in a moment here. Please share this on your pages and please share this um, on um, your groups this is very important relevant information about what's happening with the migrant caravans right now and with migration policy specifically in mexico and what mexico is planning to do i know that for many of you i know for myself as a mother there's no way no how i would be sending my children away but for many of these families that live in poverty, the income and the money sent back to their countries of origin from young people, teenagers working in the United States and sending money home, that's a viable option. That's something a lot of Central Americans and Mexicans have done in order to supplement their income. They're willing to sacrifice their children. They're willing to sacrifice their children because they need that income. And as you will hear in this report, uh, the... Um, Parents, in many cases, have made this decision knowing that they're going to be alone 
in the U.S. And in other words, the parents themselves are going back home, okay? The parents are leaving them. They know they're leaving them, and they're taking off. I'm going to be uh, ready to pop in the, um, stop this here uh, when the ads come on, but I apologize if they jump on my screen here, unwanted. Here we go. Son entregados a un familiar, cada vez más son los padres migrantes que hacen lo mismo. Esa misma noche, a las nueve de la oh, noche. Wow. It started at the end. Nosotros tuvimos que tomar la decisión de enviar a nuestros niños el primero de enero. We had to make the decision to send our children on the 1st of January. Separarse de sus hijos para enviarlos solos a Estados Unidos fue una decisión muy difícil, pero se Separating themselves from their children to send them into the United States has been a very difficult decision. Por la desesperación. But they found themselves desperate and they were forced to make the decision. Dicen estos padres hondureños. Say these Honduran parents. It's been a year since I left my country and I can't uh, stand to see my dreams um, stagnating here. So her, her dreams of getting asylum in the United States have stagnated. In other words, she is get, you know, realizing that her and her husband, this is her husband here. I don't know if you can see very well, not the greatest. I don't think that makes it worse. Um, her dreams are stagnating. We will call them Juana and 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 Andres to protect their identities. They brought their two twins, eight their two twins, um their Children are eight years old, the twins are. And then they have a 14-year-old and an 18-year-old. And they brought them to the edge of the Rio Grande. So that they could cross the river by themselves and turn themselves over to the American authorities on the other side. In El Paso, Texas. In El Paso, Texas. Yes, I sacrificed my love as a mother and I sacrificed everything for my children, says Juana. This is the new strategy used by parents in their desperation. Tras múltiples citas migratorias, dice el director del albergue para migrantes en Juárez. This is what the director of the migrant shelter in the city of Juárez reports. And of course, this is an Univision report. Uh, so this guy is saying this is the new strategy. The shelter manager is saying this is the new strategy the parents, Central American parents, are using rather than trying to seek asylum as a family. Yo tengo una hipótesis, a lo mejor nada soltera, I have a hypothesis, and maybe it's not 100% right, that the people that haven't already done it, and he's referring to sending their children over alone, the people that haven't already done it, it's because they don't have someone on the other side that will receive them. I mean, they don't have like a family member in the United States lo pueda recibir. that can receive them. Los padres se han enterado que si los niños entran solos, inmigración los libera con algún familiar en este. The parents here have found out that if they send their children alone, that the immigration authorities in the United States will release them to a family member. Estados Unidos. Lo va a el papá. Esta... The father is going to receive him, said this woman. Madre que quiso su... 
uh, said this uh, Honduran mother who also did not want to reveal her identity. She also sent her 16-year-old son across the river. She'd already lost hope that she would gain asylum, and now she wants to go back home to Honduras. It was a difficult decision for me to make, you know, to send my son, and I don't know what could happen. As the, the word spreads that children are released in the United States and given over to family members, Cada vez más son los padres migrantes que hacen lo mismo. More and more migrant parents are doing the same, meaning sending their kids over without anyone. Esa misma noche, a las de la noche, that same evening at nine o'clock at night, la llamada, ya. El... we made the call. Tío lo llamó, no se que lo... And their uncle had called me and said, don't worry. Ya me I've already received the call. Que los niños me lo van a a mí. The children will be sent to me. This is the part of the Rio Grande where many of these children have crossed. For their part, Border Patrol has said that they have not seen a radical increase in the numbers of unaccompanied minors crossing the river. And they emphasize that it is extremely dangerous for parents to be sending their kids de esa in, this, in this way. Yeah, <laughs> they're sending them to cross a river where children have died. And you have to ask because a lot of these folks never took swimming lessons don't know how to swim. I just want to stop and pause here because I have to tell you the American education system is very, very different than it is in Mexico and Central America. And one of the ways in which I find it to be extremely uh, unique here in the United States is that almost Everywhere, or maybe I was just lucky, I don't know, maybe you guys want to comment on the stream here. <clears throat> I grew up next to the Mississippi River, and every everybody was uh, required to learn how to swim. We were all required to take swimming lessons, and we were required to learn how to swim. It was odd to meet a person, especially an adult, that did not know how to swim. And even good swimmers can be caught by strong undercurrents that can kill when crossing the Rio Grande. So even if you know how to swim, there's a good chance you could get swept under, especially if you're carrying people or, you know, things. Okay? In Central America, I don't think that they have these kinds of requirements for children and parents and people to learn how to swim. In fact, most people don't go to school. Most people don't uh, finish a secondary or a high school education. Most people um, average, and this is in Mexico and in Central America, an elementary school education. So, thanks, Tammy. Um, there is a there is a huge number of these migrants, many of whom have uh, experienced poverty and poor educational systems, that do not even know how to swim. How much more dangerous then is it knowing you're sending your children across a river? hoping that they don't encounter a current that pulls them under, hoping they don't have to swim in the situation where they're crossing. 
and knowing they don't know how to swim. How could you do that as a parent? Would any of you watching this right now as a parent put your child in a river, in any kind of waterway, knowing they do not know how to swim? Could you even fathom that? But, you know, here we have it, and Border Patrol is right. Putting your children in a river, if you're parents, you should definitely not do that. But I thought I would add that note that a lot of these folks, a lot of these parents don't know how to swim. Their kids don't know how to swim, and they know it, and they still send them across. In Juarez, Mexico, Pedro Ultreras, Univision. Okay, so that's the end of that. Close that, and we'll go to the next thing. Now, I want you to uh, check out this news report. Folks, right now, I cannot answer messages, so uh, please refrain. If you want to send me messages, they're going to pop right up on the screen, and if you didn't want other people to see them, um, not to mention that it'll interrupt my live stream right now. It's not a good time to send me messages. But I am covering what I can in the news in Mexico because I want you to see what's going on specifically with uh, the, me the, the Mexican people, the difference between, between what's happening with Central Americans and Mexicans and... Um, this is a report on all of the Mexicans that are being deported back to Mexico every day. A diario están deportando desde Estados Unidos a mexicanos y a centroamericanos. And also Central American, she said. El contingente más numeroso es de gente oriunda del estado. But those from Mexico primarily come from the state de Guerrero. of Guerrero. For those of you who don't know, the state of Guerrero is where the um, resort of Acapulco is. And there has been a sharp increase in cartel activity in that state. So much so that the last time I grew up going to Acapulco, on my summer vacations, on my winter vacations with my family, almost every year of my life, it was one of my favorite places in the world. And in the last decade, um, I've taken Duke to Mexico probably six years out of the uh, uh, decade that we've been together. And in that time, we have been steadily warned about the increased dangers for tourists and for the people that live in that state. And the last time we tried to go to Acapulco, we were so horrified. We got, we spent the night in a hotel, didn't sleep all night, woke up at the crack of dawn and got the hell out of there. So sadly, um, I, I, I believe that uh, crime is, is responsible for a lot of people leaving that state. According to federal uh, statistics from um, Mexicans that are deported from the United States, 2019 figures show 211,258 people were deported back to Mexico. Mexicanos repatriados a nuestro país, 22,627 of them were from the state of Guerrero. Eran originarios de Guerrero. Pero por qué se van? Por qué se están yendo? Raimundo Pérez Arellano y Adrián Tino con nuestros compañeros. So why do they leave? But look at the close second. The close second is Oaxaca, which is one of the southern states where a lot of these caravans are traversing. One of the southern states of Mexico that um, is offering jobs to migrants right now. 
And then in the state of Michoacan, you have 18,000 or so. Uh, another state that has had an incredibly sharp increase in organized crime in the last decade, Guerrero and Michoacan. Both beautiful states, both beautiful places. Um, all of these states are, are gorgeous. It's just very, very sad what's happening there. So they're going to question some of the migrants that left their states that are stuck in Tijuana to find out what they said. Lo que les contaron. El 15 de noviembre del año pasado. November 15th of last year. Rodrigo López, habitante de Tecpan de Galeana, Guerrero. Uh, this guy, Roberto López of Tecpan of this town of Guerrero. Abandonó su hogar y migró a Tijuana. He abandoned his home state and he emigrated to Tecpan de Galena is the name of his town um, to go to Tijuana. Asegura que días antes había sido secuestrado por un grupo de la delincuencia organizada. He stated that a few days prior to that he had been kidnapped by members of organized crime. Que intentó reclutarlo who were attempting to recruit him. I, I thought that was very interesting, the way the reporters said this, that they were intending to recruit him, because listen to how he says what happened to him. Listen. By the way, this guy is in, you can see behind him, like there's a, a bunch of tents, so he's part of the caravan groups that have been sheltered there. You see the tents in the background here, folks? He says, um, they they held me, he's talking about the people that kidnapped him, they held me for about eight hours. And when they let me go, they gave me three days. They gave me three days to go back to working with them. Go back? So you were already working with them? They gave me three days to go back to working with them. That's what he said. Or otherwise, they would hurt me or my family. So he went to Tijuana and in the beginning of December, he requested asylum from the United States. First, he was in San Isidro, California, for seven days. Luego fue enviado a un centro de detención en Arizona y después... Then he was transferred to a detention facility in Arizona. A Fresno, California. And then another one in Fresno, California. En total, dos meses esperando... In total, he spent two months waiting... Una solicitud de asilo que no... For an asylum claim... No le fue autorizada. That was denied. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh, you have been found to be inadmissible to the United States. Blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so, under the provision, blah, blah, in accordance. For a period of five years from the date of your departure for the United States. So, I, it looks like he's banned from from coming and doing this again for five years. El viernes 7 de febrero fue deportado por Tijuana. Um, he was recently deported back to Tijuana. They'll only give you asylum if you are fleeing because of the color of your skin. Religious persecution. Or political persecution. And so they told me the reasons I gave, clearly, they will not grant asylum for that. I wasn't qualified, they said, because I was fleeing for these reasons, meaning the gang violence, or the, not the gang violence, excuse me, the organized crime. And they told me because violence from crime exists everywhere. What have I said? What is your 
reporter here at a Mexican Crossing Lines told you about asylum claims. Hmm? They are not granted on the basis of crime, criminals, gangs. That's not one of the ways you can claim asylum. It just isn't one of the criteria. Now, if you don't think that's fair, you may want to change our immigration laws and change the way they process these claims. But currently, there isn't a way for you to claim asylum on the basis of crime. It just doesn't exist. Rodrigo, está en el albergue Juventud 2000. Rodrigo is currently at the shelter type named uh, Youth 2000. Se encuentra a unas cuadras del Chaparral. Which is just a few blocks from the Chaparral, which is a crossing, border crossing they're showing you right now. Donde mexicanos y extranjeros esperan turno para ingresar a Estados Unidos. Where Mexicans and foreigners await for their turn to enter. Unidos y pedir asilo. Into the United States to request asylum. Ahí también se encuentra Esther Ruiz, originaria de la comunidad de Sal Esther Ruiz is also waiting there. Alatzala, en Tlapa, Guerrero. She left her home in uh, Shalazala en Tlapa, Shalazala en Tlapa, Guerrero. Llegó a Tijuana el 22 de enero pasado. She arrived in Tijuana on the 22nd of January of 2020. Asegura que fue amenazada en su comunidad por denunciar. She said that she was threatened in her community for reporting crime. Una serie de robos en su domicilio. Salí de ahí porque, pues, Folks, a... please, please refrain from sending me messages at this time. I am doing a live stream. Hold on, let me tell this person I'm doing a live stream right now. I'm live. Please wait. Okay, folks, I need you to wait on sending me a message right now because I'm live. All of your messages will pop up in front of this screen and mess up my translating, okay? Um, I'm going to have to rewind a little bit because I got messed up here. Okay. She uh, reported a series of robberies that happened. At her house. Salí de ahí porque, pues, entraban a, a robar a mi casa. I left there because they went into my house to rob me. Y yo, pues, los demandaba, pero... And I reported them. La última vez que entraron, ya, ya me amenazó el señor que... But the last time they came in, the guy threatened me. Que si yo lo iba yo a demandar, pues... That if I reported him again, that maybe they would kill me this time. So that's why I left. That's why I left my house. She'll have to wait at least another month to request asylum in the United States. If they don't let me uh, in, I'm not going back to my town. I'm going to stay here and work. Last year, the majority of the occupants of the shelter uh, Youth 2000, which has a capacity of about 100 people, were Central Americans. La situación ha cambiado. Today, things have changed. Right now, uh, we have about a 60% uh, population of Mexicans Aquí en el albergue, la... here at our shelter. And we still have more people coming. People are coming from the state of Michoacán. Guerrero. We even have people from the state of Guanajuato. Last week when uh, the president was asked about the situation, he said that he would be giving a press conference on Wednesday, giving the details sobre las cifras de official, uh, on the official numbers este tema de lo on this 
topic. Los mexicanos que están siendo Mexicans eh, justamente repatriados o de being deported deportados a nuestro país. Back to our country. Okay. So I wanted to, to share with you what Mexico is saying. And it's pretty significant, pretty important. Okay. I got to close all of these. Oops. Guys, hold on. All right, here we go. Present, talking about migration, and he's going to have Marcelo Ebrard, the chancellor in Mexico, give the speech. Muy buenos días, con su permiso, señor presidente, señoras, señores, compañeros, compañeros. Hace ocho meses se eh, anunció un plan de atención especial. Eight months ago, we announced a special plan of attention for the migrants and for the development in the southern parts of our country. Se integraron varias dependencias y una comisión intersecretarial. And to that end, we brought together uh, inter um, interinstitutional commission and various other groups. Participa en primer lugar la Secretaría de Gobernación. One of them, the Secretary of Governance. Por conducto del Instituto Nacional de Migración. INAMI, the National Institute of Immigration. La Guardia Nacional, the National Guard, la Secretaría del Trabajo, por the Secretary of, de, of, of uh, um, Jobs, Department of Labor, del Duarte, aquí the Subsecretary uh, Duarte, who's right here in this conference, a cargo de la atención Who's all of these people are in charge of the attention of migrants who are here waiting for a hearing in the United States in the northern part of our country. The Secretary of Security, which is uh, under the command of Carlos Mejia, who's also present here today. De la supervisión de los sistemas de transporte. He was responsible for the systems of transport. Ferroviario. On trains. Autobuses. Buses. Y otras vías. And other, me other means. Que son utilizadas. Which are. Para este propósito. Utilized for this purpose. La Secretaría del Bienestar por conducto del Subsecretario Javier May. Uh, the Secretary of Wellbeing. Or Secretary of Health and I mean, whatever. Uh, Health and Human Services. Responsable de. Um, and she, he named the person that heads it up. And they're responsible for. Ofrecer empleos. Offering jobs. O posibilidades de empleo. En el or possibilities of uh, employment. Sur del país. In the southern, in the southern part of our country. Se expandió. Se hizo crecer. Which grew and has been expanded. Especialmente de Sembrando Vida. Uh, especially planting, uh, the planting seed program. La Secretaría de Salud. The Secretary of Health. Para la atención médica con apoyo del Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social. Uh, for providing health services with the support of the Mexican Institute of Social Security. El Sistema Nacional de Desarrollo Integral de la Familia. Para la DIF, which is the... Development of Family Institute, taking care of minors that are unaccompanied. Los no well, minors in, to in general, but all, especially those who are unaccompanied. Y la de por de la and the Secretary of Exterior Relations for conducing. De y el they just said the name of the person heading that up. A cargo de and the cooperation and development uh, 
Institute. A cargo de la doctora Laura Carrillo. Laura Carrillo heads that up. Responsable and the implementation de los programas Sembrando Vida. And they are responsible for the planting life initiative where we are constructing future Guatemala, El Salvador, where we are constructing future uh, development in Guatemala, El Salvador and Honduras with a total investment of $100 million. So after eight months, what results have we shown? If you would allow me, uh, I would like to transmit a video we have for you um, by the National Institute of Immigration. And afterwards, I will give you the finer points of these last eight months of work. Hit it. Here comes a video. El gobierno de México atiende el fenómeno migratorio. Mexico is attending to the migration phenomenon with responsibility and uh, compromiso, commitment, and full respect of human rights, promoting alternatives for so, so that migration is an option and not a necessity. In accord with our uh, national uh, policies and international treaties. The work is coordinated between the Secretary of Governance, the National Guard, the Secretary of Exterior Relations, the National System of Health, the National System, the Secretariat of Well-Being, the Secretariat of Work and Provision, uh, uh, Social Provisions, INAMI, National Institute of Immigration, the uh, National Coordination of Civil Protections, the National Commission on Human Rights and state governments. This allows all of the foreigners coming in to receive humanitarian aid and information given to them on the alternatives they have to better their lives, to better their quality of lives. How do they initiate their uh, process to that permits them to access the mechanisms of protection from the Mexican Commission to help refugees, which is called C-O-M-A-R by its initials in Spanish, and they just call it Comar. So whenever you hear them talking about Comar, they're talking about basically the refugee resettlement program. La Comisión Mexicana de Ayuda a Refugiados. Permanecer en México con proyectos de empleo You can stay in Mexico with projects to employ people following our migration laws. Specifically with regard to the population of foreigners coming from uh, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, we can help them sign up for programs that are already set up and running in their countries of origin. Or we can assist you in returning to your country. 
to give the foreigners a better assistance during their stay in migrant detention facilities. The installations were rehabilitated and remodeled. Keeping up a very um, close relationship of communication between embassies and consulates of other countries. Las niñas, niños y adolescentes permanecen al lado de sus familias. Children and adolescents are maintain unity with the rest of their family. So they're not separated is what they're saying. They stay together. And they are attended to with special care. Which uh, intends to maintain their integrity and emotional stability. Through a variety of activities that are um, that include, uh, you know, movement, sound, activity, while minors who are unaccompanied are assisted to, through the system of national uh, development and integration of families, otherwise known as DIF. Familia. Para la de to ensure the economic prosperity of Mexico. El desde su we are trying to attend to the problem at its roots. El de la del sur. Developing the south and southeast part of the country and the northern part of Central America. My dad was going. He had just uh, come from feeding the animals. They called me about that paper I got in Mexico. Yeah, I told him they did. And he said, do you think it's, it's for real? And he told me, really, you think that uh, other countries are going to care about helping you? And I said, well, you know what? I'm going I'm to go check it out. And when I went and asked, they said, yes, you qualify. So now I really believe it's true. The Mexican fund, through the Mexican fund, they are creating 60,000 jobs through this program. Through the programs called uh, Seeding Life, or sowing life, or planting life, and the other program is called Youth Constructing the Future. In El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Because in this country and in this region, we share a same fate. A same destiny. We are partners in our journey. And we are taking charge. The government of Mexico. That was fancy. Do you like that? The plan for immigration and development. Here comes a new one. 258 million what? I missed it. La migración es un fenómeno global. 
Migration is a global phenomenon that originates because of a variety of factors. Political ones, religious ones, racial ones, socioeconomic ones, insecurity, because of family and natural disasters. Mexico is a place that people cross through for, by, uh, by obligation. Ah, won't turn. Um, uh, places that generate a lot of migration, like El Salvador, Colombia. They're talking about 194 formal entry points, 65 of them by plane, 67 of them by sea, 62 of them by land. And then they're talking about there's 3,169 kilometers of border between the United States and Mexico and 1,149 1, 1, kilometers at the southern border. It's very small. Cuba, Guatemala, Haiti, and Venezuela. All of which have the objective of reaching the United States. Adding to that the number of migrants that are coming from other countries. So in 2019, there was 12,825. In 2020, there's already 312. In total, there's 13,137 from all of these other countries you see here. And all of the ones you see over here. So we got Russia, China, Korea, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Almost 600,000 people came into the country of Mexico illegally in 2019. They did this in part through eight caravans that we registered coming through, and others did it individually. So together, we probably received more than a million people. Uh, with this exponential growth, the government of Mexico established a, a plan for migration and development based on combating corruption, coordinating with the National Guard, offering employment to people who are migrants in the southeast of Mexico, and building relationships with Central American governments and Caribbean governments. These central points are the priority to ensure human uh, safety and to strengthen legal migration that is orderly and secure and transparent and to prove it we have fired 893 public servants for um for doing their jobs improperly and for not passing the um control and confidence trials. We have made a lot of changes in the National Institute of Immigration to combat corruption. Uh, among the strategies of the INAMI, uh, priorities are contention or containment in the uh, northern and southern borders, 
with the use of the National Guard and federal agents of immigration at the 100 and however many points of uh, entry. Two, infrastructure and services at the uh, southern and uh, northern border. 12 encampments were installed that just like the 66 permanent installations uh, det or detention facilities or migrant facilities, they receive special attention for these vulnerable groups. In 2019, uh, Inami remodeled 15 migratory stations costing 396 million thousand pesos. So I, 396 mil millones de pesos. Of which part came from the Comar in order to give them proper shelter. Inami gave out 4,705,212 rations of meals four hundred and forty thousand one hundred and four um, um three hundred resources like he's given out blankets but it could be clothes or whatever uh, medicine botellas y pipas de agua. bottles of water Three, to reduce the number of people that are rescued and in shelters. Four, special attention to girls, boys, and uh, adolescents, both accompanied by their parents and unaccompanied. Uh, five, permanent medical attention a las personas migrantes. to migrants and special attention to 49 migrant mothers cuyos hijos nacieron en México. whose children have been born in Mexico. Se canalizaron 34, we provided 34,207 consul medical consultations las médicas a la Secretaría de Salud y 8,800 consultas and 8,800 uh, medical consultations through the Mexican, Mexican Institute of Social Security. Six, prevention and investigation of organized crime who are smuggling people. In 2019, the Institute of Migration in Mexico, they brought charges again to, against 277 people smuggling, human smugglers. And they also put out 37 arrest warrants. They seized 228 vehicles. And they identified 28 uh, networks of human trafficking. And 10 of them were international smuggling rings. Seven, coordination with state governments. Eight, coordination and participation with religious institutions. ONGs and international um, organizations like the United Nations Human Rights Organization, 
the ONU migrate OIM ACNUR, the agency for the UN for refugees UNICEF. and UNICEF. In 2020, the UNAMI has received 129 visits. 129 visits from associations, civil so, civil associations. That's ONGs, nonprofits, all of those things you just heard them talk about. And in 2019, they received over 12,000. Did you see that? And what number are we on? I don't even remember. Whatever the next number was. Uh, coordination with uh, human rights. In 2019, CNDH received 736 complaints of violations of human rights. And they made recommendations um, based on that, one of which was directed to the current administration. In 2020, the CNDH has only received eight complaints against the migrant uh, authorities, four of which were presented because of the caravan that came through in 2020, the recent one in January. You know which one we were just talking about. Ten, relationship with the Central American governments and the Caribbean. In 2019, 179,971 people came into the country. Out of them, 126,961 were adults, <coughs> 91,670 something men, 35,283 women, 53,000 of these were kids. Out of those 35,000, almost 36,000 were girls, oh, sorry, were kids with their parents and 17,000, um, you know, 17,000 plus were unaccompanied minors. In January of 2020, there was, there's was been uh, 11,709 people that have come in illegally. And they've already, they've returned um, in total 191,680 people. Mexicans repatriated or deported from the United States back to Mexico in 2019 is 211,383. Mexico has received uh, this total, but out of those, 198,613 are adults. In 2020, they've, re uh, they've already received 18,376 people in this year. Let's see if I can scoot this back a little bit more. Hold on. All right, let's see if that helps. In 2019, the National Institute of Immigration has reported that, let's see, let's 
it back even more. There. They received 267,000 migrants. 267,735 migrants. Out of which... While in 2020, they've already uh, received 21,687. Uh, with uh, looking at these numbers, it seems that the, the uh, tendency is the numbers are lowering. Taking into account that they registered 140 some thousand, 144,278 in the month of May, and then you can see in June it goes down to 104,000, and so on and so forth, so that by the time that you get to all the way into January of 2020, you're down to 36,637. So there's been obviously a down swing on the number of migrants. It's important to recognize that this irregular migration, illegal migration, they call it irregular migration, uh, represents only 3% of 39 million people that have come to Mexico. So out of the total of people that come into the Me Mexico to visit and do things legally, uh, people that come, period, uh, you know, the people that are coming in illegally is, is a, you know, kind of a drop in the bucket in comparison. 97% of people that go into Mexico do it legally. They go there with the interest of touring, you know, tourism, or bi or business. In twenty nineteen, they people requested um, migration paperwork from Mexico, like a visa or you know whatever a. There were they they did five hundred and seven six hundred and seventy seven requests. Which resulted in seven million actions. Which resulted in all of that amount of money being paid for these you know different processes, which was a sixteen percent increase in what they had anticipated. Um, so their their budget was five thousand six hundred and eight million thousand pesos. To provide assistance to these folks regardless of their migrant status. This is a lot of jargon about how great Mexicans are and the integrity and taking the reins of the migrant problem, blah, blah, blah. The National Institute of Immigration in Mexico strengthens the country, making it more secure and all this good stuff. They have, Mexico has all the virtues can, that you can find in humanity. It has hope. It has the belief in that tomorrow will be better. We believe in liberty and justice, democracy, and places all of this 
on the shoulders of human rights. Ta -da! The government of Mexico. Thank you. So, what I want to highlight is the most relevant uh, data that we have of these last eight months. So the first one is that we've re re reduced the crossing, uh, illegal crossings into the United States by 74.5%. That's a lot. That's the graphic you see behind me. Also, coincidentally, the National Institute of Immigration in Mexico had less rescues to do. You see the same tendency is uh, in, in the number of rescues they have to do. You can see that by December, um, those numbers are reduced significantly. Um, the investment that Mexico has made in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, in Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador, which is part of the development plan that we have, um, that is uh, already showing some returns. Especially in the case of El Salvador, where to date they have created 6,061 new jobs. The goal is to reach 20,000, which means that Mexico would be the only country that gives this number of jobs to people who need to migrate because of um, poverty. Because no other country in the world is doing it. I also want to highlight our National Department of, of uh, Employment has contacted and backed uh, 4,979 migrants. Oh, 4,989 migrants who were given different alternatives of work. The Secretary of Well-Being that uh, specifically works in the southern part of Mexico they're uh, currently um, helping 3,093 migrants uh, who are employed who received employment in the states of Chiapas, Oaxaca, Tabasco, and Veracruz. And they also created 4,210 new um, uh, employment spaces for migrants. These were agreements that were made for new employment, for new developments, for these many jobs to develop uh, with these local municipalities and local businesses in the southern part of Mexico. 
Y hay 22 albergues. They have opened 22, there are 22 shelters that are uh, given resources in Chiapas, Oaxaca, and Tabasco through the Secretariat of Wellbeing but there's also you remember a uh, um, significant decrease in the number of people using those shelters as I just uh, mentioned through the, through the previous graphic the Secretary of Health and the National um, Institute of uh, Social Security have supported us in this program so that we could have 70 we could give 70,000 medical consultations and 1,400 and some vaccinations especially for minors the Secretary of, La of Labor or Jobs, que quedó a cargo who's in charge de of it, a los que están en México, su of caring for the migrants, especially those that are awaiting their hearings of asylum in Mexico. Los una caída muy you can see a significant drop in the numbers there, too. Se llegó a un punto que se tuvo mensualmente cerca de yeah, there was a point at which we had uh, about 50,000 people we were uh, addressing monthly. This month we're estimating we're only going to have around 2,000. In total. So the Secretary of uh, Labor, as I was saying to you, created They've attended to 3,000 and some migrants at these two shelters. One of them is in Ciudad Juarez. And the other one is Carmen Cerdán in Tijuana, Baja California. I just brought you a report of that Carmen Cerdán in Baja California where nobody is going, where they've never had a, even 100 people a night, right? And they're not paying their employees. So he's not talking about that, but... And they spent a whole bunch of money, he just said. I, I showed you the numbers re before on rehabilitating and uh, remodeling all of these uh, detention facilities. That had, you know, basically been in disrepair. And that put, you know, migrants' uh, well-being at, at risk, so we spent the money. We made that investment. With regard to human rights, we did not receive any recommendations from the National Commission on Human Rights due to any action by the National Guards within the program. So, in summary, we have positive results. We are reducing the flow of people that are illegally entering. And that's our principal objective. And I want to highlight this. And that is, people that are in Mexico must be here under the provisions of the law of Mexico. For example, refugees. Refugees 
have increased dramatically. Mexico is a country that gives refugees give, gives refugee status to those who solicit it. We are one of the countries that has a percentage uh, that we have a higher index of migrants um, between the, you know the we we uh give the status to more people percentage wise than any other country uh when compared to the number of people requesting refugee status so who is requesting refugee status people that have problems in their countries of origin I cannot respond to messages right now. Hold on, folks. Let me um, let me talk to folks and let them know. I really can't do this right now. Okay, hopefully I won't have to do that anymore. Right, so check to see if I'm live, folks, because uh, sometimes I do these. It's important for you to know what the Mexico plan is. So we're not trying to stop people from requesting refugee status. They are requesting it. What we propose to do is to lower the risk that people have for those who wish to migrate, especially when they're doing it illegally, because that puts people's lives in danger. That's the last thing we want. And of course, that, as the president has said many times, that they could have option, you know, uh, job prospects and a dignified lives, dignified lives in their countries of origin. So. Um, what Mexico has offered in this realm is also follow, being followed. As I've said, we've already created uh, six, over 6,000 jobs in Honduras, in El Salvador. And Honduras is also uh, en route to, do, uh, to, to create jobs. And we just started that work there, but it goes, it's, you know, headed in the same direction. So we're hoping to reach a total of 60,000 employ em, jobs in those three countries. Just to give you an idea, if other countries would do the same thing we're doing, we would practically have uh, in the south of, southern part of Mexico a number of jobs available that is greater than all of the experimental migration, all of the migration we have experienced in the last two years. So that's basically the advancements we have made. Your question? Go ahead. 
responsable de Grupo Gili, el imparcial de Sonora, la crónica de Mexicali. She's telling all the places she works for. Y frontera de Tijuana. Eh, canciller, sobre el programa de los retornados, eh, protocolos de protección de migrantes. She's asking about MPP, Desde, Migrant eh, Protection eh, Protocols. De Estados Unidos. Si seguirá siendo apoyado por la administración federal. Are you, is the federal uh, government of Mexico going to continue to uh, support MPP? Este programa, el programa MPP, protocolos de protección. Ajá. Y hasta cuándo terminará este convenio? And when will that agreement end? En el caso de los mexicanos solicitantes de asilo. And in the case of the Mexicans that are requesting asylum in the United States. Eh, no queda claro si serán enviados a Guatemala a iniciar el trámite. Uh, it's unclear whether they will have to wait in Guatemala to request asylum or. Eh, si nos puede aclarar este punto. Can you clear that up? Si son los centroamericanos que deben esperar en México. Si les da... uh, Central Americans that have to wait in Mexico. O, o no el asilo. Si, si van a esperar los centroamericanos y if they don't get asylum do they have to wait in Mexico eh, también si se va a mantener la política de no dar recursos a los albergues para atención de migrantes a los... are you also going to maintain your stance as a federal government that you will not give financial resources to privately held shelters los albergues particulares y, y, y si tienen del, del dato que dieron de la inversión en, en albergues para, para, para los migrantes. And if you could talk about uh, the shelters for the migrants. En el norte del país, si, lo, si tienen el dato cuánto se ha invertido en las estaciones migratorias. If you could give us the, the data on how much has been invested in, in the uh, um, shelters. So, you, which of the four questions? Do you want me to answer all of them? Yeah. Okay, fine. But there's there's a lot of questions there, and there's a lot of other people here that want to ask questions. But, okay. Nice to have you here. <laughs> He's annoyed with her. Yeah, we've reduced the number of people that are waiting in Mexico uh, under migrant protection protocols from 50,000, which was at the highest point. And in this month, all along the northern uh, border of Mexico, uh, we will only have a total of 2,000 and some. So you can see it's an incredible drop in numbers. And, and we don't expect that number to rise. That uh, trend uh, of, of people uh, going down is going to continue. Uh, the United States has agreements with, three, with third countries. Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. Y entonces, muchas de estas personas están esperando en esos países. ¿no? So, there's a lot of people that are requesting asylum that are waiting in their countries. No están esperando en México. They're not waiting in Mexico. Eso es un acuerdo de Estados Unidos. And that's an agreement the United States made. Con otros países. With other countries. ¿Por qué razón <coughs> México no ha cambiado su postura ni la cambiará? Why is Mexico not changing its policy on that and why will we not change it? Why will we uh, continue this policy of uh, keeping those people in waiting in Mexico? Because if we don't accept them, they will be deported to other countries. So we're trying to protect their right to have that hearing. Asylum granted to Mexicans continues to be a very small number. He's, this is so quiet, it's so hard to hear. I have to rewind it.
There's no way for me to raise the volume on this. And any, any noise in here makes it very hard for me to hear what's going on. I'll wait for you to come through. Because it's very, very hard to hear this. It's almost a whisper here. Probably it does not exceed even 900 people to date. The largest number of people that are in the United States right now are people that have work visas. All different kinds of work visas that they have obtained and they're working in the United States. And that number of Mexicans is greater than the number of Mexicans being deported back to Mexico. This had never happened before in history. So this is very significant what he's saying right now. The number of people being deported into Mexico is less than the number of people working with work permits and visas in the United States. So there's more Mexicans legally working in the United States with work visas and work permits of all different types than there are numbers of people coming in illegally and having to be deported. Uh, and the question of the support uh, to shelters, uh, that we are helping shelters through and, and NGOs. But that, that support comes through the states. The cost in be, between Juarez and Tijuana for shelters is 45 million pesos. And 20 million for the migratory stations that are in the northern part of Mexico. Thank you. What is going on in the northern part of Mexico? Since last year, the United States initiated these stay in Mexico policies with the migrant protection protocols. Bien, lo mencionaba. Los migrantes están esperando en nuestro país, pero se habla algunas organizaciones no gubernamentales que en diciembre pasado había hasta 6,000 migrantes que no estaban siendo contabilizados, estando en campamentos. As you mentioned, um, and there are a number of nonprofits and ONG, NGOs, etc., that have uh, taken into account a large number of migrants, approximately around 6,000 of them, that have uh, not been attended to uh, and are staying in encampments. Uh, 
like the tent cities you've seen. En una situación vulnerable. And in vulnerable situations, where they could be victims of kidnappings, assaults, that are simply waiting for their hearing to come up in the United States for asylum. What are you going to do about these people that are in these encampments? Are you aware of them? If they're denied as refugees in the United States, what options will Mexico give them? Have you located them? Do you know how many there are? And what nationalities they are? And what do you know about any of the Mexicans that are in waiting for an asylum claim? What will happen to them if they're denied? The, we have attended to them uh, with uh, INAMI and with the Department of Employment. And they have been offered a variety of alternatives. So what is the, the what are the numbers here? What are the facts? Today we estimate for the month of February, one thousand five hundred people in the whole border of three thousand and some kilometers at that northern border of Mexico and all the diver different points. And then he goes like this, like he's do, 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 all the different places. 2,000, excuse me, 2,500 people. That's the total. And I want you to compare that number to last year when we had up to 50,000 people waiting in these tent cities At, in one month. So obviously there's been a very drastic drop. So in the case of the Mexicans that you mentioned to me, you cannot stay in Mexico when you are requesting asylum because of I mean, there's a lot of misinformation about this topic and lies, too. So, if you go to the United States and request asylum as a Mexican, you can't come back to Mexico to wait for your hearing. I mean, the whole purpose of your request for asylum is that you're not safe in Mexico for whatever reason. So, and they have considered, the, Mex the American authorities have considered the possibility uh, of making people wait for their asylum hearings in Guatemala. And that's their decision. We don't we don't have we don't agree with that. We don't share that decision, he said. We don't share that decision. But that's why I'm explaining the nature of this topic. What you have at the southern border is co nationals that have to sign up, that have signed up to request asylum. There's 900 of them. So you're waiting for your, your asylum hearing. 
te apuntas del lado de mí. Entonces, you sign up on the Mexican side. Es, es, es un fenómeno que ocurre tanto en Tijuana como en algunos otros puntos. Me explico. And this uh, phenomenon is occurring in places like Tijuana and others. Para tú pedir asilo en Estados Unidos necesitas hacer una entrevista de miedo creíble. To request asylum in the United States, you have to go through a credible fear interview Con un oficial de CB CBP. with a CBP official. En territorio de Estados Unidos. And you have to do it on U.S. soil. Previo a eso, Prior to that, hay una fila. there's a line. Te so you sign up y estás a que te digan qué día te va a el for it to be in that line so you can know on what day you will cross into the United States to have that credible fear interview. And those people in line are some of the people that you're mentioning are staying in these tent cities that you refer to. Out of them, the people that are Mexicans, we have a number, it is around 900. Out of 23,000 Mexicans that have arrived, and, and in, in the, num the total number of those that have been repatriated, just to have an idea of the proportions we're talking about, those are the official numbers we have. And what are we doing to attend to those being deported? Well, the first thing that we have to do is give them proper information. There's a lot of misinformation and it's very confusing. Y ofrecerles diversas alternativas. And we try to offer them a variety of alternatives. Para el caso que decidan permanecer en México, no en sus lugares de origen exactamente. Porque... In case they decide to stay in Mexico, not necessarily in the, where they originated from either. Si estás en la frontera para pedir asilo, pues a lo mejor no quieres estar en el mismo punto. I mean, if you're at the border requesting asylum, you might not want to go uh, to specific points. Pero si puedes estar en otro punto en México. But you could be at some other location in Mexico. So we're working on that. Um, so this guy says that the something business association, something met, and he wanted to know whether or not the federal government thinks that they should have some more kind of responsibility or if they're coordinating with them, with the business community, so that they can give uh, support, financial support, resources, donations, and jobs to the migrants. Is, is the government of Mexico working with the private sector with social and civil organizations, NGOs, blah, 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 all that stuff, with, uh, with regards to shelters? And we know that a lot of these uh, institutions, the businesses and uh, NGOs or other civil uh, organizations have programs in place specifically to help migrants. Is there any synergy with the federal government to work together? Thank you. Yes, they have helped us. In the north, in the south, to try to integrate, you know, those uh, job positions. 
and with what we've been developing. In fact, they made over 10,000 job offers available to us. There's 4,000 and some uh, job openings in the north that are have already been filled. And in the southern part, we have like 5,000 that got jobs, migrant jobs. So the private sector is doing that. And we also have received donations for the shelters and the migrant detention facilities. So I would say they've done a great job. Last year, the International Inter-American Commission on Human Rights made a pronouncement calling out, calling on Mexico to avoid the use of violence, to, to avoid the use of disproportional violence against the migrants who are uh, attempting to enter the country through because due to the uh, events that occurred with the caravan that entered in the middle of January she's talking about the the 15th of January caravan So yeah, so they um, they made a call out to Mexico of not using force. And they also said they were going to be announcing a date to go and visit detention facilities in the north and in the south of Mexico to check out the conditions of our detention facilities. And I wanted to know if you already have that date. Nope, I don't have the date. Uh, the way we were uh, informed about this is that um, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights had made a proposal to come to go and visit uh, detention facilities in the United States and they put Mexico as uh, and areas nearby to the detention facilities of the United States in the southern part of the United States. And we, so we responded to them, we would uh, be very happy to uh, to escort them, but they needed to make a formal uh, request to the Mexican government to visit our country. We're not uh, nearby area to the United States. We're a different country. So now they've done that. And so we're definitely going to accompany them uh, and their, on their visits to our detention facilities. And when we have that date, well, we'll let you know. With regard to the use of disproportionate violence, as I have said recently in this press conference, our institution of human rights did not make any recommendations with regard to the actions of the National Guard. 
Nacional apoya al Instituto Nacional de Migración. Es un... And the National Guard is an arm of the National Institute of Immigration. Under the law, that is one of the, their duties. So in Mexico, the National Guard, which never heretofore existed, is basically kind of like what ICE is in the United States. You have Customs and Border Protection, you have what what we consider our what was what was the INS, which is now immigration. Um, and then you have the arm that is the enforcing arm, which is ICE. In Mexico, it's the National Guard. So, in the recent uh, um, caravan that you mentioned, where the National Guard had to resist the caravan, it was because they tried to come in by force. So, so let's be clear about what took place. They entered, they tried to enter using force. And there's, the, there's all of the evidence of that. And we offered the caravan all of the options that Mexico has available. We even held a very long dialogue with them because they had already been told. The organizers of that caravan had already told the people in the caravan that all they needed to do was put their name on a little piece of paper like this. You'd fill out a little paper like this. Very, very briefly. And that that would be uh, their uh, solicitation for refugee status. And that by filling out this one piece of paper, that would give them the right to travel all the way through Mexico. That's what their organizers told them, the people in the caravan. Which, of course, we know is not the case. So the Commission on Refu Refugee Assistance, which is kind of like Refugee Resettlement and Assistance Program, were dialoguing with them for a long time. So let me summarize what occurred. In, 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 in none of these operations of the National Institute of Immigration along with the National Guard has there been a use of violence of disproportional violence, like you said. We're going to very happily work with the uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And they have every right to be concerned about the migrants, as do we. But what we cannot allow is the total out of the had to have out of all the total of people that come to our country to request refugee status or 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 a work permit in the southern part of our country that are that are that are joining these programs like seeding life or planting life there are all these other things I've talked about which is the vast majority of the people that are entering these programs the correct way, that are doing things peacefully, what we cannot allow, a small group of people, in this case approximately 900 people, try to enter our country by force. Because if we allowed that to happen, we could even put their lives at risk. The whole of migrants. So things have to be done according to the law.
And of course, when we get that date, we will give you the date. Okay, folks, that's as, as far as I wanted to go. There are there are more questions in this press conference. A lot of them have to do with migrant status or migration. But that was a really good one because he pushed back on that whole propaganda of the use of the National Guard and he explains everything. Um, I think you can understand Mexico. When, when President Trump says that uh, President... Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador is his buddy and that they are doing a great job in Mexico. The numbers don't lie. They had a 74.5% reduction in the number of people that have gotten to try to even enter the United States. They have had a, a significant reduction of people going to the shelters, using the shelters. And they have spent a lot of money on infrastructure and on uh, providing services and development of jobs in Central America and in the southern part of Mexico for the migrants. So um, with all of that being said, these other stories I shared with you about people sending their kids across the border alone, unaccompanied, um, is one of the newer tactics because requesting asylum, that ain't going nowhere. It is becoming apparent to everyone that has been waiting, some of them have been even there a year, that they're not going to get their asylum claim um, granted. And they're, they're just wasting time. They're just sitting there at the border for months and months and months and months. And in the end, they will be returned to their countries. So um, stay tuned for more on Mexican Crossing Lines. I will be bringing you more updates and reports about policies on immigration and especially with regard to what's happening in the caravan coming up very soon. Thank you for watching. Please share on all your platforms and have a great day.